So there are certain things that I would not give up. Netflix, red meat, in and out Burger, Netflix, okay. Maybe I would give up Netflix, but you know, for many that are trying to achieve financial independence, financial freedom, you hear people that are trying to do the whole fire thing, financial independence, retire early. You know, these people are saving like 97% of their income. Well, in those situations, like you gotta give up something like Netflix. So that's why I was a pleasant surprise when I was talking to this guy who retired at 35 and he did so and he didn't give up Netflix. He also didn't give up working out, didn't give up his gym membership. So when I think of people retiring early, achieving financial dependence, especially at the age of 35 and not having to give up the things that they absolutely love, that's what I wanna hear more of. So today you're going to meet Steve Adcock. So Steve founded a blog, sold it, but that's not really his story. That's part of his story, but that's not the main story. Where you're gonna hear more about is how did he actually retire at the age of 35? Five, him and his wife, they had some crazy goals. They made some major sacrifices, but also kept a lot of the things that they loved. So you're gonna meet him, learn more about his story. And if you have ambitious dreams of achieving financial independence, retiring early in your 30s, well, then you definitely need to check this one out. So if you're ready, let's go. All right, what's going on, y'all? So I'm getting a chance to meet Steve for the very first time. I guess I can't say in person, but on camera. So we actually can see each other face to face. And I was just sharing a little bit, a little bit uh, with Steve about how I discovered him. And the funny thing was like, it was after he sold his blog, which I'm sure we're going to talk about. But I've just got a chance to hear, I guess I'll say hear or read a lot of things that you share on Twitter. I mean, you just have a, some amazing content that you share there, which I'm which also means you're sharing a lot of other great content I'm, I'm sure I'm not aware of. But yeah, dude, it's good to meet you finally in person. So let me just start. Let's start here. Actually, no, this, this is where I want to start. For those that are listening right now, uh, I am looking at Steve's recording studio. <laughs> And so over his right shoulder, I see a, a squat rack. I see a pull-up bar. Um, to just to, Let's just start there. You know, tell us a little bit about what you're excited about, you know, what your mission is right now and why you have a squat rack over your right shoulder. <laughs> well, let's see. I live out in the middle of the Arizona desert, which means I don't exactly have a gym right next door that I can go to. But fitness has always been a huge part of my life because I want to, you know, I want to do things while I can. And you know, fitness is like my is my way of being proactive with my health as much as I can to make sure that I can continue doing things as long as possible, you know, doing physical things, getting out and hiking or what, or whatever. So that squat rack behind me is how I maintain my health to a large degree. I also have a cable machine. I have all kinds of dumbbells. So my home gym is where I spend a lot of my time. That also happens to be where my office is. So I can just say that We've converted our garage into my office and my gym. So you can be sure I spend a whole heck of a lot of time out here. That's awesome, man. And that's something fitness is for me. Um, something you may not know. Like, so my, my father passed away when he was 67, had a heart attack. He had two bypass surgeries. Uh, my grandfather, his dad passed away when he was like 63. Uh, so I have that in my family. So working out being as fit as possible is like, it's something that's very passionate to me. You know, I've got four kids, three boys actually just played my 11 year old one, one-on-one -on -one basketball yesterday. Um, I'm like, I can't believe I'm actually sharing this, but he beat me. <laughs> oh, he probably kill me too. There's no doubt about it. Uh, and it's not so much like the cardiovascular, but like I've, I've been dealing with some like knee pain, which is military is also CrossFit related because I've squat, uh, squat clean, all this stuff. And they say to warm up for those who are listening that are a little bit younger, warm up, like listen to us. I'm in my forties now. Like I, I wish I would have warmed up more, but either way I could still hang with him. Like I didn't pass out. It was relatively close. I, I kept it. Uh, I kept it close. So I was grateful for that. So obviously, personal finance, money, <laughs> investing, you know, financial independence, like these are very important to you, you know, something that you did with the blog that you sold and then have continued on. What is it about your journey, you know, going back 
pre-blogging, maybe just as your childhood growing up, that is why any reasons that happened back then that make you so passionate about personal finance and financial independence today? Well, for me, personal finance is, is primarily a means to an end. And that end is being able to control 100% of my time and not have to work for eight to 10 hours a day, five days a week. The minute I graduated from college and set foot into an office, I was like, this is it. This, this is what I have to look forward to for the next 50 years. There's no way I'm going to do this. So, I mean, I luckily chose a high paying career field, information technology. Um, and at the time, I didn't necessarily know about financial independence. I didn't know that early retirement was really all that possible. I just kind of figured that you had to be super rich in order to quit your job early. And yes, you do have to have some money, but you don't have to be super rich. So a few, few years down the road, I was like, well, this, this kind of sucks, but I mean, this is what you got to do. This is what people do. They work, they earn, they spend, they work, they earn, they spend, repeat, 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 repeat. So that's kind of what, what I did for the first 10 years of my life until I finally started to put these pieces into place. Um, regarding my future and what I thought that was going to look like, especially after I met my wife. And then we started to collectively talk about what we wanted to do in our future. And, you know, those talks never seemed to revolve around going to work. It was always travel and experiencing the world and doing fun things, not just spending eight to 10 hours a day in an office. Uh, so that's really where all this all this started. My my distaste or just, just the fact that working doesn't really work, quote unquote, for me, at least in a very structured way where, you know, I have a boss looking down my, my shoulder for all those hours. Wasn't going to work for me and it didn't work for me. So, I mean, I would say many people probably share, you know, these sediments, right? Like, for uh, sure. Like, yep. like I, I have a job, like <clears throat> this, this can't be the, the end solution, but yet, so many people stay stuck. You know, they, they want to do something different. They talk about doing something different, maybe sure. secretly or outwardly, but yet many people don't. Uh, they just settle or they just, you know, fall in that, that belief that, no, I, I, this is just what it is. How can I do anything different? There is no other option. What, so you're having these conversations with your wife. At what point did that conclusion come like, no, like the, I'm not going to settle for this. I, I want to do something different. You know, when did that start? And then what were some of the action items that started taking place to make this reality happen for you guys? Well, before we got married, we had a choice to make. I was going to move in with, with her and sell my house. So we only have one house to maintain and one house to pay for. But she also worked in information technology. She's actually a rocket scientist, an actual rocket scientist. So I definitely married up, believe me. So, <laughs> I know, right? So we had all this money now, probably combined, I want to say, to 220 to 30 230,000 a year combined. So that's a good amount of money. So what do we do with that? We can either live the high life, we can get the vacation home or go on expensive vacations, get new cars, new cell phones, you know, just basically live like we are quote unquote rich. Or the other side of that is we could also live as frugally as we possibly can for the next three, four, five, six years, wh whatever that, that happened to look like. And for us, it was about four years, I think, and save as much as we possibly can, as quickly as we can, then quit and pursue a life of travel and adventure. And before we got married, what we wanted to do was sell everything, buy an Airstream and go travel the country for a living. And that is ultimately what we did. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here, but that, that is what we did. That's what our passion was at the time. So it was just that, it was that fork in the road where we have all this money coming in. We can either live like we're rich or live like we're not rich and then retire as soon as possible so we can live a lifestyle of adventure. And that, that's obviously what we did. Um, and tracking our expenses was so, so paramount. We already had the income part down, $230,000 a year. We got that pretty good. But then that, that next step is how do we not spend the majority of that living like we make $230,000 a year? So we ended up saving her entire salary, 100% of it, is in savings and investments. And then we lived on about half 
of my salary. So that meant we saved slash invested about 70% of a over $200,000 yearly salary. Let me tell you that that adds up so, so quickly. I'm glad that you said the percentage because, you know, you hear so many different types of percentages that people can save, you know, oftentimes like you'll hear, Oh, make sure that you put in enough in your 401k to get the match, you know, whatever that is. Sure. Like, yep. that's, and that's <clears throat> great. Right. Like that's a great start. Uh, but the reality, like if that is all you save and you have plans on retiring, even at 65, like chances are like that might not be enough. So here you are <laughs> saving 70, 70%. Most people hear that and are like, Nah, nah, you're lying. <laughs> There's no way. Um, and I know the first time I ever heard that percentage, I was like, what in the world? Like, how does that even happen? Um, you, you guys are already having these conversations, right? So this is obviously something that's very important to you. What were, I'm curious on a few different things. One is, you know, what were some of the lifestyle changes that you had to make? Like that was, that's a part one, a question. The mm -hmm. second is, what were the comments, the chatter that you got from either family or friends or coworkers when they found out how much we're saving, if they, if they found out. So first part is, you know, what were some of the lifestyle changes? And then also just like having to address mm -hmm. other people's um, uh, interest in the lifestyle yeah. changes that you guys are making. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, the changes really come down to controlling our expenses and that meant like never going out to eat or very rarely. We, I think we gave ourselves like 50 bucks a month or something to go out to eat. And I love, <clears throat> love going out to eat. So, so for me, that was like the biggest, I guess, drawback or negative or sacrifice or however you want to call it to this, to this whole business of retiring early. But I mean, we tracked our expenses so closely that for a couple of years, we could have told you how much we spent on sweet potatoes every single year, just that specifically, along with everything else that we bought. You don't necessarily have to be that detailed, though I, though I met a rocket scientist who loves Excel spreadsheets. So <laughs> we went to that level, but I would say that's probably not required for everybody. But what is required is knowing where you're spending money, because there's no way it is impossible to cut your expenses if you have no idea where your money's going anyway. And that first step is so tough because you have to go through your credit card statements and bank statements and just understand where the heck your money is going. I mean, you might be spending 150 bucks a month on a cable TV package with movie channels. That's that that you never watch. But if you don't check that bill and understand where, where that money is, you have no idea that you're spending that because it's all automated. It just comes out of your bank account. You never really have to think about it. So those things are tough. It's, it's, it's a tough habit, a tough pattern to get into. But once you do start making that progress, the snowball or that the snowball begins to build becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and it becomes easier for you to realize what's an expense that's like legitimate or what might be uh, uh, an expense that, that you can certainly cut out. And for us, the majority of what we spent on were expenses that we can cut out. We kept our gym membership because that was health. Like I said, spent about 50 bucks a month on restaurants. The majority of our spending was on food from the grocery store and also um, our mortgage, of course, at the time. But other than that, we spent so little, like no magazines, no cable TV. Um, you know, we kept internet for obvious reasons, um, but we really streamlined for those few years. And that really uh, enabled us to save money really, really quickly. Um, and I would say, in regards to your the, the second part of your question, my friends didn't necessarily understand it, but to their credit, they also didn't really criticize. They, they were like, okay, if that's your thing, that's your thing. And really, I wish everybody was like that. It, 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 was, it was kind of refreshing, actually. They certainly were not going to do what my wife and I did. They have no interest in that whatsoever, but it's, you know, li live your life. You know, you do you, I do me, that kind of thing. So it worked out well. And my family was largely the same way. In fact, my dad retired at 49. Um, so I, I came from that background where you don't necessarily have to follow conventional wisdom and the status quo and things like that. So he was definitely on board because he did something similar. That's so awesome. Like you don't hear like coming, I'm coming from your dad's generation where, you know, pensions, 
you know, we're a big yeah. Social Security is like you know also a big <clears> thing. So the fact that he even retired at forty nine, like that's that's amazing. Like that that's incredible in itself. So I feel like you had some good personal less personal finance lessons passed down to you. Yes. Yes. In fact, I had my first, he opened my first Roth IRA when I was like 16 or something like that. I mean, I didn't have a huge amount, amount, amount of money yeah. there by any means, but at least I had something and I was, I was at least somewhat aware of how this wealth building machine works. Didn't really put that into place until later in life, yeah. but I, I at least had exposure to it. Exposure, exactly. I mean, my, each of my kids right now, at least my older two at least uh, have a Roth IRA, a custodial That's Roth perfect. IRA. Yep. Yep. Um, the, the financial lesson that my dad uh, passed down to me was he didn't open up a Roth IRA. He told me if there's anything that I want that I can't afford it, just open a credit card. That's what my, that's what my oh, dad told that, me uh, to do. That's one way to do it. <laughs> uh, and I, I listened to some of that advice early on in my career. Uh, grateful I was able to marry a spouse that recognized like, no, that's not what you do. That's not how That's not how. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah I, I like... I, Go ahead. Oh, so I learned the hard way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I like to think of credit cards as a convenience. You have the money, but you're spending it on a card to get points or whatever. It's not a way for you to spend money that you don't have. It's a way to spend money that you do have without having to carry around a bunch of cash. And it provides fraud uh, protection and it actually warranties a lot of the stuff you buy. There's so many good things about credit cards as long as you're responsible with them. Yeah. And just because I want to touch upon this, I'm glad that you said that because, you know, I, where I live uh, actually is about five miles from Dave Ramsey's new office. Oh, Dave nice. Ramsey is somebody I, I have respected Dave for a number of years. You know, total, total money makeover was one of, I think it's either first or second personal finance book I ever read, you know, and I, that was at the beginning of my financial planning career. And there's like a lot of good advice, you know, just the emergency fund and uh, just exactly. the baby steps and all that. Like there was some good stuff there. Uh, you know, here recently I've read his post where he talks about how, you know, a millionaire doesn't fall for the credit card tricks for reward points or something. And I mean, I get it. You have to be somewhat polarizing, you know, to get attention in this day and age, but like, I yeah, circle because it's like, <laughs> I, I have like four or five different credit cards. Uh, we use them, you know, a couple different businesses, a couple different for personal and family, you know, we yep. pay them off each every month. Actually, my wife pays them off halfway through the month. We don't have to, but that's just how she is, which that's mm -hmm. awesome. That's great. You know, and we just uh, recently went to the Dominican, took our entire family of six, you know, paid for airfare, pay, paid for uh, the, uh, the stay at this resort, all through our reward points. And it's like, I'm not falling for a trick. You know, it's just like, no, it's just a resource you know, that we're taking advantage of that's super easy. It's actually, it's super easy to track all of our expenses and, you know, through our QuickBooks and everything. And it's like, why not take advantage of that? You know, a little bit of credit card reward point arbitrage to take our family and have a good time. So anyway, I, I wanted to, I wanted to mention that. So I'm glad that you said that because it is a tool. Yes. People mismanage this tool, but it also has a lot of other benefits as well. Exactly. We just flew to Panama first class to visit a friend of ours completely with points. So yeah, it's, it's, it's wonderful. And I guess what Dave Ramsey might mean with buy it's a trick is some people might spend more just to get the points, even if yeah. it's on craft, like things you shouldn't be spending money on. So in that case, yeah, I suppose he, he he's correct. But if you, if you just spend money that you would normally spend, but you also collect points on that money, then you're getting the best of both worlds. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, we're in this journey. So 2014 is when you started the blog, thinksaveretire.com. Yep. Um, at what point in this journey of you going on these four years or you're saving your 70%, you know, you're talking about financial dependence with your, with your wife, the rocket scientist. Uh, <laughs> at what point did you feel, did you start Think Save Retire and start sharing this journey? Actually, it was almost simultaneous to our start. And for me, I know the way I learn. I know the way I stay motivated. It is to write. It is to write about a subject that I'm passionate about, that I care about, and that I want to learn more about that subject. So starting the blog originally was like my way of forcing myself to stay on track, forcing myself to continue thinking about this and continue learning and continue getting smarter with money. So to be perfectly honest, the blog was a completely selfish thing. 
to begin with because it, it was my way of learning more. I had no real like goals for it, like page views or money. None of that, none of that, absolutely none of that when I first started. Then like people started like actually reading this. It's like, wow, people care about what I'm what I'm doing, what I'm writing, like people are commenting with encouragement and I'm like, this is pretty cool. So then that I just started to slowly ramp up over time to where it became a really, really big influential site. Um, I sort of got burned out of, of, with it in 2019. So that's when I sold it. But I mean, for the longest time, the blog was really my way of staying focused and motivated towards this whole financial independence thing, because I felt an obligation to make this blog the best that it possibly could be, because I knew that people were reading it and getting value out of it. And it was kind of like my way of, of, of giving something back, I, I, I guess, or teaching other people what I've learned throughout this whole process. Yeah, because like during this journey, because you know, the FIRE movement really took uh, people started noticing it. You know, you had other content creators like publishing content. And that's like when I first heard about it. Yeah, it was like seventy percent. Like, really? Is that is that a thing? <laughs> I mean, that, that was new for me. Like, you just didn't hear that. You know, I, I had uh, ca came from the financial service industry. You know, drank that Kool Aid for the longest of time. So I've been mm -hmm. trying to like you know siphon myself off of that. You know, recognize like <laughs> there are are different ways. You know, and um, so like it's it's been exciting, refreshing to hear. And, you know, just like hearing some of the things that you've shared, like, yeah, there's a lot about your journey. Like, oh, no, like, that's not for me. You know, like, I like to eat out, you know, like, there are things that I do like, but I think what people need to understand is like, personal finance is personal. So it's like, you find what works for you. You don't have to go in the full 70%. But I think, I think the, the important thing I want people to know is, if you think that saving 10%, 5%, getting that free match is enough, you know, I, I have been in this long enough to see people you know, approaching retirement and having the biggest regret I always heard across the board was wish they would have saved more, wish they would have started earlier. I heard it time yep. and time again. Uh, so, I mean, maybe it's not 70%, but it better be more than five or 10%, unless you just really enjoy working and want to work till you're 65 or longer. Uh, and maybe you have a pension, probably not. You know, if you're banking on Social Security, don't do that. <laughs> you know, you, you got to take control and, and do it for yourself. Yeah, exactly. And I think there's so much wisdom in saving more than 10%, even if you like your job, because you might like your job now, but yeah. things have a way of changing. You might have a new boss that you just cannot stand, or you might have health issues that prevent you from work. You have no idea what's going to happen in the future. The more financially secure you are that you start making yourself now, that gives you more freedom and options in the future to control your life more fully. So even if you do love your job, you can't imagine doing anything else. You just want to work till you're 80. That's fine. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you can afford to only save 10% because like I said, you have no idea what's going to happen next year or the year after or the, the year after. Just preparing yourself the best you can is going to give yourself way more options, way more freedom in the future. So you mentioned like you had you had the blog, you, you're reaching people. And I think we, re, we were, uh, you put something on Twitter about, you know, wanting to reach, you know, to like a million people plus, like, you know, with, with your message. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm kind of just curious what what led to that burnout of selling the blog because, well, you know, I, I go to steveadcock.us, like this is your personal blog, and it seems like you're still writing. I don't know how often you're publishing, but it seems like this, it, you're, and obviously you're on Twitter. But, I mean, if you don't follow him on Twitter, which mm. I don't know if you update your handle. I love the uh, Steve on speed. <laughs> I know. Yeah, that was, <clears throat> yeah, there's a story be behind else. that. Yeah, There's a story okay. behind that, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I want to know that before we get up here. Uh, but what led to the the burnout of deciding to sell, but then also then continuing to want to share the message, you know, because that you're so passionate about. Yeah, the think save retire became this it, this I don't know this business entity almost where I felt compelled to keep churning out the content. So I was writing, I think twice a week, I had a, a fairly large email newsletter, not as large as yours, but it was respectably like 10 or 15 K or something. So it, it became almost like a chore to be perfectly honest. And, you know, this company, this brand approached me and wanted to sell and, and that 
an, uh, I came to another fork in the road. Like, can I, do I see myself doing this <clears throat> for the next five years or not? And ultimately I decided not, like, I, I couldn't do this. I didn't see myself doing that, but I still, like you, like you noticed, I still want to be involved in this whole process, but not in a realm where I feel compelled to write. I churn out this content all the time. So on steveadcock.us, I write more or less whenever I want. In fact, I just published an article today, but the one previous to that was, I don't know, maybe a few weeks ago. But where I really spend a lot of my time is Twitter. I wanted to build the Twitter account that I wanted to follow when I was going through this whole process. There's a lot of financial bloggers out there, but they don't really tweet about blogging. They tweet about their meals or what their kids are doing, or they complain about this and that. That stuff just isn't helpful. So I wanted to, I wanted to create the account that I always wanted to follow. And I think I did that. Helping a million people or getting my message to a million people, that's tough to track. But as I look back on Think Safe Retire and my followers on Twitter and the emails I get and the DMs I get, I mean, it's kind of just a, it's kind of just an estimate. I think I'm about a quarter of the way there. I've really reached 250,000 people to make positive changes in their life, and I have about three times that to go before I reach my goal. Um, but I mean, really, if I'm a positive influence in this community, I write about about money and kind of from a, from a different perspective that you might hear about, encouraging people to try new things, just doing what they can. I think, I mean, that's really all that I can possibly ask for. Dude, that, that's awesome, man. And, and the, for the people that don't understand, like when you're publishing content, whether it's blog, you know, blog content, video, podcast. It's relentless. You know, yeah. it, it's, it's relentless, but it's also, it's super <clears throat> hard to stay motivated because for everybody that reaches out and says, man, thank you for doing that. Um, I don't know what the percentage is. You probably have like 10 times the amount of people that want to reach out and say that you're a loser. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the hate. Yes. The hate, yeah. Or just people don't say anything, you know? And I know that for me, like to help me stay motivated because, you know, I came from the, 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 where I was meeting with people face to face you know, mm -hmm. helping them reach their retirement goals. And there was, you know, that immediate gratification of somebody saying, thank you, Jeff, for helping us. You know, so coming to the online space where ever so often, you know, I'll get an email, a message, a, a DM, whatever. But uh, I think it was just a few weeks ago, somebody commented on one of my YouTube videos and said that they had watched one of my YouTube videos from like 10 years ago, which I don't I didn't even know I had been doing it that long. <laughs> uh, must've been horrible, horrible audio and quality, but, uh, I was talking about the Roth IRA or something mm -hmm. that I'm, I'm very passionate about, something that you mentioned earlier. And this person, I guess, watched this video, opened a Roth IRA, has been investing in it for 10 years and has over six figures, you know, in their Roth, you know, and Ooh, they, that's and great. They gave, they gave me credit. It's like, yeah, like awesome. Right. Like that, that's so cool because, because of something that I did that I promise you, I have long forgot about but inspired this person, you know, they still had to do yep. the work, you know, they still had to go out and figure out where they want to open the account and actually have that discipline to invest and, you know, do it on their own. But it's still, I gave them enough. And I'm sure you have an impacted, inspired people to take action that like, that is so gratifying knowing that you've made, you know, coming from a family where my dad passed away with a negative net worth, knowing that I am knowing that we're helping people change you know, their future, potentially their kid's future. I mean, it's hard to wrap your head around, but like when you do take pause, reflect, it's like, gosh, like it, it just, it does feel good knowing that you're adding some sort of positive influence in the world. Yeah. And if you're a creator, understand this, that for every person who reaches out to you to thank you for something that you've done, you've probably impacted 10 times that, 100 times that, 1,000 times that. The fact is most people won't thank you, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're not reaching them. You absolutely are reaching them as long as you stay at it and, and, and you stay motivated. I've had people re reach out to me saying that they've started their first 401k or that they built their first emergency fund. And that stuff almost makes me cry. It's like, yeah, that's so great. This is exactly, this is exactly why I'm here. This is exactly why I do what I do. And there's a lot more people out there that, that you're reaching, but most people just don't reach out to actually tell you about that. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> so sometimes we just need 
each other to remind us, hey, yeah. we're doing a good thing. You know, keep, exactly. Keep, you know, keep at it. Yeah. Keep at it. Um, before we before I learn about this whole Steve on speed, uh, you know, the one thing <laughs> I, I wanted to point out because when somebody say when somebody says they are saving seventy percent on retirement. Um, you know, that means there definitely are things that you need to cut back on. Yeah. And most people just hear, oh, that means you can't do anything. Obviously you, you said you kept your gym membership, you kept internet, you know, just recently you posted on Twitter, um, where to go, uh, basically talking about, do you think ne Netflix is a mistake? Ah, uh, you know, yep. you're wrong. You know, if you're using Netflix as a way to unwind from a stressful day, it's time well spent. And I think I love that, right? Because there are things, oh, I'm you're trying to cut back on everything. It's like, well, I just can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do this. And there are some things that, yeah, treat yourself, reward yourself. You know, like you do need, I know for me, I've got four kids. Like I do need some time to work out. You know, I have a <laughs> yep. gym as well. Um, or to me, like I, I'm an, I'm an audible audio book guy. So I love going on walks and listening, you know, to books. Like that's one of the ways that I, that I read, you know, like, and that's just a, a uh, one other thing that I totally justify, I'm a baseball guy. I love baseball. I love watching Cardinal baseball. That's just my thing. I'm very sad, disappointed. They got eliminated by the Dodgers, Dodgers in the wild card game, but that's a whole other topic. Um, <laughs> but I pay like $60 a year uh, to watch the Cardinal games. Like whenever I want, my boys are Cardinal fans. So we enjoy watching that. Uh, mm -hmm. But there's also, we've recognized, man, like we, you know, we cut the satellite and all of a sudden like, oh, let's just do one of these subscription ones a little bit cheaper, right? And now like everybody has one. So you, so you got like direct TV, whatever it's called now, yeah. direct, direct TV now, but then you got Paramount plus and you know, then you got Peacock discovery and, and Disney. Yeah. Dear exactly. Lord, I'm like, Oh my gosh. Like now I'm paying like four times as much as I was when I had satellite. But yeah, anyway. exactly. It's, it's kind of ironic. But I, I think the slippery slope is that, that justification of I work hard, therefore I deserve this which there are some things, yes, but I think there's the other things where I deserve a new car. I deserve a new wardrobe. I deserve this. And that is a slippery slope for a lot of people. I don't know if you can touch upon, like, how does one find that balance of knowing, hey, yeah, I reward myself with Netflix or, you know, maybe a day at the spa or whatever that is for you. Yeah. But like, how do you, how do you, how do you protect yourself from going down that path where like, I deserve this and this and this and this, <laughs> and this is just today. We'll talk about tomorrow, tomorrow. You know, how do people, how do people protect themselves from that? Yeah. You're, you can't live your life in a way where it feels like a sacrifice. Cause that's just not, that's not going to work. Nobody likes to live that way. And what I like to do is I like to encourage people to think of money as a representation of time. And this is especially true if you have a goal of early retirement. Let's say you want to retire by 40 or 50 or whatever. What, how much time is that new car worth to you? If you want a $50,000 car, depending on how much you make in salary, is that worth working another year, working another two years so you can afford to buy that car? If you think that it's worth it, if you do, if you're okay with working longer in order to fund your lifestyle, that's fine. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. That's just a choice that you have to make. But for me, what really helped was not thinking about expenses in terms of like the, the sheer money value, but in the the, the time that I would have to spend, the extra time that I would have to spend doing something that I don't like to do, and in my case, it was working full time, in order to, to spend money on those things. And that's effectively how we got up to 70%. Because for me, I wanted to retire early so bad that nothing, nothing was worth the extra time. For the most part, yes, the the gym and you know the occasional restaurants, and I think we had Netflix um, that we were paying for at at the time. So those things were okay, but in terms of these big expenses, it it just it, it wasn't it wasn't worth it for me. It wasn't worth working longer. Uh, something that my dad used to tell me when I was younger, he said, "You could have anything you want, but not everything you want." Hmm. And by that, he means you pick and choose what the most important things are for you, but really be realistic about what you want versus what you need. And that whole process is very, very difficult for a lot of people. It was very difficult for me as well. But I think the very first step 
in this entire equation regarding cut, cutting back and what to cut back and how much to cut back and how much to spend is know what you want in the future. Have that end goal. If you have a spouse, talk about it with your spouse, get on the same page, understand what you're working for. Because once yeah. you have that light at the end of the tunnel, that's going to make everything else so much easier. If you want to retire at 50 with this amount of money and you're here with this amount of money, you have to figure out that delta between how are you going to get from here to there? And then the pieces start coming into place. But if you don't have that light at the end of the tunnel, you just continue spending because you think, well, there's, I mean, I guess I'm just going to work for the rest of my life anyway. So I'll just spend money here, spend money there, whatever, whatever I think makes me happy. There's nothing really I'm working for. So if you don't have that light, if you don't have that, that, that future goal that you're working towards, I think it's going to make this entire process way, way more difficult. Dude, I mean, I couldn't think of a better way to end <laughs> this, this interview, man. Like that, that, that in itself, like was amazing as pure gold. And as a reminder, um, something I learned, uh, I guess we'll say the hard way as well is like, you know, when you're saving just to save, like it, it's hard to get excited. It's hard to stay motivated. Exactly. But when you, yep. when you have a goal, you know, and, and which also takes work, you know, like trying to define like what you really want is, is hard and many people don't do it. So that's why they find themselves stuck in a job or a situation that they don't like, you know, but when you do the work to figure out what do you really want, what do you want to work towards and reverse engineer it to, and just figure out what those first steps are. And that's exactly what you did. And that's why I just, lo I love your story. Um, I love everything that you, that you're working on, what you're doing. Um, Gosh, you got to follow this guy on Twitter. I see. Oh, I forgot. Steve on speed. Tell, <laughs> tell us that. <laughs> okay. So I, I began my, I started this Twitter account back in 2009. So this is way before the blog, way before early retirement, all that stuff. Because I just wanted to be on Twitter and just kind of test it out. And at the time I drove a, a 1999 supercharged Corvette with like a racing camshaft and long tube headers. And it was the loudest, fastest car around. So that is, that's where Steve on speed came came around. That's how I, 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 I got this. I got the idea for this name because I drove a supercharged Corvette and a Yamaha R1 sport bike. And I just like to go fast. I was an adrenaline junkie. That's how that name came around. I probably should have changed it after selling Think Save Retire and like transferring back to my personal account that I started like years ago, but quite frankly, I wasn't that smart. Um, <laughs> I guess I could change it now, but I mean, it's linked to in so many different places and it's just a mess. So I am living Steve on speed for the rest of my life. <laughs> Dude, people, if they go, go and follow you on Twitter, I mean, as much as you produce and, and just the way you do it, I mean, it is like you're on speed, man. Like, I mean, you continue <laughs> to put out like just such good content. Like I just, I truly enjoy, which is weird for me to say this, right? Like I mean, when you follow people on social media, it's usually for the pictures or maybe mm. for the articles they share or for the memes or, or gifts that they, that they re retweet. Um, <laughs> like I, you're one of the first ones I can remember that I started following because I truly enjoyed what you were putting out. Like I enjoyed reading them. Um, which is, it, it sounds weird even me saying that out loud. I'm not sure why, <laughs> because that's just not what I, I saw Twitter as. Uh, you know, for me, it was like, oh, I like to read people's content or watch their videos or listen to their podcasts. But like, you're one of the first people that I truly enjoy what you what you write. Like, it's actually it's a treat. It's a treat to read your tweets. Check that. <laughs> Well, I appreciate that. Like I said before, I, I wanted to start the Twitter account that I always wanted to follow. There's a lot of money people out there, but very few of them actually tweet about money. So yeah, if you are interested in money and personal finance and leveling up your life, that is what I talk about. I don't link to articles. I don't plug my blog. I occasionally plug my, my email list, but that's generally in comments to my, to my higher level tweets. That is what you get on Twitter if you follow the right people. So fascinating. I just realized you're right. You never do share any articles. Like I, ever. I'm, well, never. almost, almost 
but still though, i mean i'm just yeah. scrolling down here and i'm going back like almost a month like i don't think i've seen one article I, oh look you retreated somebody <laughs> I, was, uh, I think you're commenting on uh, something that Kiyo, uh, uh, said. yeah yeah uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> It's a now, whole, other, whole other podcast, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I, I could spend 40 minutes talking about his, his tweet. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dude, well, obviously, so Steve on Speed on Twitter, people can find you. Where else can people connect with you if they want to learn more about you and, and what you're working on? Uh, steveadcock.us is, is my main website slash blog. So that's that's kind of where I <clears throat> talk about my projects and I and I write my blog posts and, and things like that. So th- those two areas, steveadcock.us and Steve on Speed on Twitter are the two main areas. Awesome, dude. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. Sorry for taking you from your workout. Uh, no worries, dude. You got you it, You don't man. have to travel far to get it done. So <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's literally two feet behind me. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much, man. All right. Thanks, Jeff, for having me. I appreciate it.